Uh, it's terrific to be here with you. I'm going to talk about deep fakes, what they are, what it is about us and the society we live in that make them dangerous, the kind of harm that they cause, and what we can do about it, which is modest, but we're going to talk about you know, some solutions. Okay, so what is a deep fake? So how many of you know, okay, I like the show of hands thing, I'm copying Andreas. <laughs> how many know what a deep fake is? I'm gonna explain it, but I see some, not a lot of hands, okay. So deep fakes uh, are a technology, machine learning technology that lets you manipulate or fabricate out of total digital whole cloth video and audio of people saying and doing things that they never did or said. Now, they appear authentic and realistic, but they're not. They're total falsehoods. Now, you might say to me, okay, Danielle, lies are nothing new. You know, we've gotten used to the conversation about fake news and falsehoods. And lies are as old as we are, right, as humanity is. But deep fakes, when we put together our sort of basic human frailties and platforms incentives, they can turn them, it's us, in combination with platforms that turn them into weapons. So let me explain. So we have a visceral reaction to audio and video. It grabs us. We believe it's true because, you know, on the idea that we can believe what our eyes and our ears, of course, are telling us, right? And we're drawn, this is no surprise, but we're drawn to the provocative. So studies have shown after the 2016 election that people were 10 times more likely to spread fake news than accurate news because we're drawn to the novel and the negative. We're less interested in the sort of bland and accurate. And of course, we love information and we tend to share it if it confirms our worldviews. And so when you put those human frailties, that kind of toxic brew together, and you pair it with the incentives of platforms is when we run into trouble, right? So the whole business model of online platforms is advertising, right? So they make money when we click and like and share. And we're going to be much more likely to click and like and share deep fakes or information that's attention grabbing, that's salacious, right? And so it's in the business interest of these platforms to ensure that destructive negative information goes viral. They make money out of it, right? So now what's the harm that it can cause? Digital impersonations. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the harms to individuals with a focus on women in marginalized communities. And then the kinds of harms that we could see to our democracies, to our sense of trust. So let me tell you a little bit about Rana Ayub. She's a, a journalist in India whose work exposed government corruption and human rights abuses. And she, she sort of had gotten used to online vitriol, because after all, she was criticizing the Hindu nationalist government for its human rights abuses. As, and as a Muslim woman, she sort of expected this sort of rough and tumble of online abuse. But nothing prepared her for what happened in April 2018. She was sitting in a cafe with a friend when she first saw it. Her phone blew up. It was a video of her engaged in a sex act. But of course, she had never made a video of herself and engaged in, in a sex act. And it looked just like her. She showed me the video. I interviewed her for my next book on sexual privacy. And it looks vividly like her. She's beautiful with big brown eyes. And it looks like she is engaged in oral sex with a stranger. Um, and it goes viral in 48 hours. In 48 hours, it's on nearly every phone in India. And all of her online accounts, Twitter, Facebook, are overwhelmed with death and rape threats. Online, people impersonate her and say she's interested in sex and available for rap rape fantasies and they post her home address, so she's doxxed, right? Her cell phone number, her parents' address, and she lived with her parents. Um, and she was terrified to go outside, lest someone make good on their threats. She stopped writing, so she's a journalist. You know, she makes money and living from writing. She shut down all of her online accounts, 
which I have to say is a tough thing to do when you're a journalist because those are the outlets that you let you reach audiences. And she pretty much went undercover. Um, you know, as she said to me, she felt like there were a thousands and thousands of eyes on her naked body, even though she knew intellectually, right, it wasn't her mouth, it wasn't her breasts, but she experienced it like it was. And she was terrified um, and couldn't continue her work. It, it took about six months for her to kind of come out from at least even physically to walk outside. So, no, this isn't unusual. So, a recent study, so September 2019, Deep Trace Labs issued a study that found that 96% of all videos that are designated as deep fakes are deep fake sex videos. And 99% of them are of women, their faces being inserted into porn without their consent. And so the kinds of harms that Rana Ayub experienced, the 15,000 deepfake sex videos that now appear online, um, on eight of 10 of the most predominant porn sites and on four sites devoted to deepfake sex videos, are gonna have the same kind of impact and risk the same kind of cyber mob that Miss Ayub faced. So it's going to have an impact on women, and we have seen disproportionately, right? So now, it's of course not just women and, and individuals who are gonna face this kind of abuse. We've seen deep fakes used um, to coerce um, uh, money from CEOs, so faking a video saying, oh, you have to send money to this account. Um, and people have been tricked um, into uh, and deceived into sending money. We also might see a, a kind of a distrust that's generated, right? Imagine the night before an election, a deep fake showing one of the major party candidates gravely sick, right? If time just right, it might tip the election. And the same is true for a deep fake that's released the night before an IPO, right? Imagine a deep fake showing the CEO saying something outrageous, offensive, you name it, right, fill in the blank. It could tank the IPO, right? So the, the impacts are not just on individuals and groups, but society at large and democracy. Um, and it's tough, you might say, all right, there's a lot of fakery, there's a lot of fake news, what, what is different? But what's interesting and what's something, not only do we have to worry that we're gonna believe the fakery, but that we're gonna start disbelieving the truth. We've seen politicians say of real evidence of their wrongdoing, that's not me, that's just fake news, right? President Trump said a year after the Access Hollywood came out, that tape where he apologized for it, he said, oh, I was, that wasn't my voice, that wasn't me. And of the Holt interview, he subsequently said, I, I didn't admit that I fired Comey because of Russia. He said, ah, it's fake news. And so my co-author, Bobby Chesney, and I are worried that we're gonna see liars leverage the deep fake phenomenon to escape accountability for their wrongdoing. So, okay, so what do we do, right? So I'm a lawyer, a law professor, and civil rights advocate. And there is some potential for law, right? Right now, law is not up to the task. We don't have laws that comprehensively address digital forgeries. And so my colleague, Dr. Marianne Franks and I, um, she's the president of the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative and I'm her vice president. Um, we've been working with folks on Capitol Hill, both on the House and Senate side, to devise a federal criminal law that would address harmful digital impersonations. Um, we don't have a comprehensive solution also outside the United States and so, in some respects, we have to sort of work together on that question. Now, of course, we are also busy talking about platforms, right? And in the United States, we have an immunity from liability for online service providers, and that should change. But in the meanwhile, online service providers like Twitter should, and Twitter just did, ban deep fakes that are harmful. Now, it's gonna be expensive, like, because how do you tell the difference between a video that's satire and parody, right, and a harmful impersonation that's defamatory. So you gotta hire content moderators, and it's expensive. But it is worth the trouble. 
because we've seen great destruction while also important uses that we want to preserve. And in many respects, a lot of this problem is at our doorstep, right? We click, we like, we share, and we don't even think about it. And so some of this, of course, has to be that we tell ourselves, each and every one of us, that we got to think before we share online content, right? I don't want us to, I don't want us to think that we're in a post-truth environment. We can't believe anything. Uh-uh. Let's resist that, right? But we've got to at least think carefully before we amplify fakery uh, and spread destruction. So in the meanwhile, as we sort of think about legal solutions, solutions that have to do with education, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of destruction to go around, right? Rana Ayub is still struggling with the fallout of her experience. Um, and, and there's no doubt that all those individuals that appear in deepfake sex videos, their sexual identity has been hijacked. It's been stolen and exploited. So this is something we got to wrestle with and face now. So thank you so much for having me.